what kind of an audience we have. Can you raise your hand if you ever attended a Hyperloop workshop before? What's Hyperloop? What's Hyperloop? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it's about fifty percent, which is a which is a good good percentage. Um, generally, we do this PCB design workshop. Uh, Josh, you can switch the pin back over to the screen share, or Vicky, you can screen share again. Uh, usually we do this PCB design workshop after the circuit construction workshop because we get to show you how you can turn circuits from something like this to something like this. As we can see, on this circuit, there's a bunch of wires, and on the circuit, there's like no wire. It's just all copper traces, this uh, fiberglass here that makes all of the magic happen. Sorry about that. So um, we are doing this a little out of order this semester, as I believe the sort of construction workshop is actually next week. But I do encourage you to go ahead and attend that if you if you can. Um, a bit about a bit about my background. Uh, I also graduated with a degree in computer engineering last year, uh, but. Different from Vicky, I actually do most of my PCB design as a hobbyist. So I create things that would be useful for my projects uh, in building robots, building things that would help me out like this voltage regulator kit, or even things that are kind of fun. So I built this PCB actually for one of my earliest workshops or earliest project endeavors in which I built myself a keyboard. And this PCB was very essential in getting that keyboard to work. So uh, you'll see, uh, this workshop being taught to you from two different perspectives, one from someone who works in the industry and one who does PCB design just for fun. Um, I am now working as a systems engineer over at MIT Lincoln Labs, and so I'll do, be soon doing this PCB stuff full time. But as for now, all of my experience just comes from doing this for fun. So I hope you'll enjoy this PCB design workshop, um, and I'll hand it back off to Vicky to start the lecture portion. As Vicky's lecturing, I'll pass some of these samples out to you guys so you can play with the uh, PCBs and see what you're going into. But hopefully by the end of this workshop, you'll be able to design a fully fledged PCB from start to finish. Back to you, Vicky. Okay, hello. And just to emphasize like Chris's expertise even more, Chris is, is one of the best engineers I've ever met. So any of you guys that are just interested in building from zero to something and something amazing like i would definitely talk to chris because he has he's the most scrappiest but the most deep dive engineer i've ever met so just gonna pat that in there for chris <laughs> um but okay let's get into the design workshop can you see my screen everything's good yep. okay um so the bc design workshop intro to pcbs okay so what's a pcb a pcb stands for print circuit board um, so we'll dive into that soon, but this is like general without too much information explode. This is what a PCB looks like. So in the past, this is the reason why it went from the past to today. And this is why there are workings in the PCB space. So in the past, there was just a bunch of wires onto one board. As you can see, it's really messy. Pretend like now we have so much more technology. Now we have so much more advanced capabilities when it comes to designing circuits, designing really advanced circuits with high pin counts. Now we can have today's design because it would just be impossible to manually connect, manually connect everything that we have, for example, on this board as in, in the past, which, you know, now we have advanced products out in the world, which are really exciting. Um, like your phone, your phone's capabilities are just insane about how they can fit in such a small little device and how much they can do and it's definitely very overlooked um because everyone's just like oh it's a phone it should just work and I'm like there's a lot that goes into that so like this this is just a fun appreciation of it um to showcase to you guys so uh I can't see. okay so why create a pcb so in the past for example this was a motorola tv without a pcb and you can see like the base of the product is literally copper just copper <laughs> and that's how everything's connected whether it be mechanically to the copper or there's just random like circuitry in there and sure it works but it's probably not the for example easiest to carry around when it comes to practicality um even if you do carry it around maybe it'll have a few there might be some reliability to it but it's not the most reliable thing where you can just maybe you know uh, you can drop your phone on the floor and it's okay. What's up? Vicky, right. quick, quick question. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so, hi. Uh, is, so, 
the mm -hmm. scan stuff, is that all install insulation? Sorry, can you say that again? Uh, the tan the tan stuff between the wires that is all that insulation. That's you. Are you talking about the wires inside of the TV? Oh no, I'm. Left picture, right picture. Left picture. Uh, left picture. Left picture. Left picture. Like the phone looking stuff. The phone looking stuff. No, no, no. It's like a tan in the background. I think that's just wood. Oh, okay. Each one, uh, present, this? apparently. Never mind. It's <laughs> not important. Are you sure? Yeah, yeah. It's general curiosity. Um. Okay. I'm not sure. I don't know what you're exactly pointing at. Um. So. Okay. So let's go back to the. I can't go back. Oh. Oh no. <laughs> oh no. Okay, sorry. Ah, quick rendition. Let's go back to this one. So essentially, okay, not to dive too deep into it because we will dive deep, deep into it later. What is inside this green area? This is green is called solder mask. It's an insulator. Um, but it's the way a PCB is formed, because otherwise in that TV that we set that we saw, it was just flat copper, right? Copper tends to be a really good uh conductor for heat. Um, so that's why we use it for electrical circuitry. And essentially when you create a PCB, it's a bunch of substrates that are used for insulation, but also copper in them because we wanna have different layers. So it looks really thin. It's very, very thin, but it's a bunch of like, it's like substrate, copper, substrate, copper, blah, 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 blah. We'll get that into later. Um, so when you see it over here, this is just the copper There's like, I'm not sure if they have substrate in there or not substrate, uh, some, some form of an insulator when it comes to maybe a coat or something. I don't even know if they had that. Sorry. <laughs> but um, generally what I'm seeing is just copper, straight copper connected because you'll see like the, the plugs or not the plugs, the mechanical um, interfaces right here that are directly connected. So um, yeah. Okay not to dive too deep into that. And then, so on the right, uh, oh no, okay. Okay, the technique to both hold electron, oh, so the PCB is a platform that can hold electronics and also establish connectivity, right? Because we're gonna, we're seeing these like copper lines jump from pin to pin. They're using these vias to jump from layer to layer that we will get in later. Um, so yeah, this is how it's created. Uh, and once the PCBs were actually created or actually a thing from moving from left to right, that's when the first space race started between the US and Russia, because now we have the capabilities to even create a rocket. So I think that I find that really interesting um, to just see where we've come today. Um, so yeah, this is another example from the left to right. It's an old calculator we see on the left. So now what we have today, I mean, um, or today's motherboards, is just so different. Like this is how big a calculator was, and this is how big a, a motherboard that like basically has computers capabilities to for you to use your laptop or motherboards to rockets, motherboards to so many different devices, and it's so small and so compact and so advanced. So um, a PCB is a electric assembly that uses copper conductors to create electric connections, as we can see. So it was basically a role. There's a bunch of different ways a PCB is created. We won't get too much into that, but let's just say it goes from copper. There's a bunch of processes it goes through that you can have copper etched onto the board or added or subtracted, filmed onto the board. Then you have solder mass. So what I was talking about earlier is that this is how, this is kind of a layering of a PCB. It's copper. Prepeg is a form of an insulator. A core is also a form of an insulator. Um, then you have your copper right there, and then prepeg, and then another copper layer. And then you have the green solder mask, and that's what we see. So there's a couple of different types of PCBs. We have a single-sided, which means, let's say, um, this is your PCB. So single-sided means all the components are on the top layer, um, single-sided, right? Uh, the bottom is like, there's nothing on it. Maybe it has something on the PCB when it comes to the copper. Like you wanna put a ground copper, a ground copper ground equals net, right? 
Um, so that's single-sided. Double-sided means there's comp components on the top and on the bottom. Um, a multi-layer board means that there's a bunch of different layers. You have a bunch of different copper layers inside of the board. A single-sided, the difference between a multi-layer and a single-sided is that, or a double-sided is that there's copper only on the bottom and the top. But multi-layer means bottom, top, and in between top and bottom, right? So then you have a rigid, a rigid flex PCB. Um, let me just hide this. A rigid flex PCB that we see on the right. So essentially you have a couple rigid boards. A rigid PCB means it's it's not bendable. That's a very uh, complicated situation. It should not be bendable. Um, in which you see the green, the green PCBs on the top and bottom left. But then you have these flex PCBs that use a polyamide ribbon, see that red little interface um, to connect things together. Uh, and for various reasons to use on phones, I believe. I haven't been able to, cut, to touch on that. It's definitely an advanced part of PCB design that you get throughout the years. So that is that. Um, OK, so the structure of a PCB. Um, so what I was talking about earlier is that we had this layer stack up built with alternating layers of conductive and insulating material. So how it essentially works, at least in this scenario, this is called a foil construction. Um, there's foil construction and core construction. We'll just get into foil because that's the most common way PCBs are fabricated. So essentially a fabricator will get, um, oh, we can definitely dive into this, but I won't dive into it. Okay, <laughs> so uh, a core is basically a dielectric. It's a piece of insulating material that is wrapped around copper um, on top and bottom. It's basically laminated together. Um, so for example, the copper that we see right here but there's a core and there's a copper. So those are two coppers already sandwiched together. They'll sandwich this pre-peg on the top and bottom, which essentially are pre-peg you can see as like glue and in the most simplest form and simplest communication. It's like glue, but it's an insulator as well. And then it's like half cured. Core is already cured to the copper, so it's like hard. Pre-peg is like, okay, I want to wait a little bit to be fully cured so I can add the copper on top, copper and bottom, then I'll fully cure everything. This is kind of silly. And if you know anything about nails, I just, so basically I just took a test. Um, it's called the IPC CID license, which essentially helps you gain a really good fundamental on PC design. I highly recommend it if your company pays for it. Um, and hopefully if you'll ever catch on, it's really interesting because the way a PCB is created has similarities to the way um, you do your nails. So that's really interesting. I thought it was really funny because you have to like cure your nails and then cure different areas. So like it's an interesting relationship, but that was silly. Anyways, um, so the way a PCB is structured um, really depends on what use cases there are for the PCB if it comes to high power, high current, uh, sensitive signals, or you're dealing with RF. Also, if you're dealing with you're on Earth versus you're dealing about it in space, um, so many different environmental variables that come into the design that you have to be aware of. And then also you have to be aware of, like, can the manufacturer actually create this? Because in a beautiful world, we can create whatever we want, but we can't yet. So that is that we're going to dive right into terminology. Um, so how does it, how do you go from zero to a PCB, right? Um, we have these things called schematics. I sure you know schematics. If you don't, essentially it's a circuit that's put together, but it's made of a bunch of different, um, electrical equipment when it comes to like resistors, capacitors, you have active components, you have passive components. Um, so you have essentially when it creates when you create a PCB you have your schematic that um, has a symbol right and then we have to convert what does that symbol look like in physical format like something that we can actually see and touch and I'm sure you went through the workshops now we have a footprint um, or what you see on your breadboards right so that little chip this is the 2d version of it in order to create that board or that um, PCB, you'll need a footprint, and this is where the PCB librarians come in. 
their job is essentially to help manage the databases that hold these footprints that count or that have that they manage the footprint to data sheet um, compatibility. They're always in tune with what's going on. They're always figuring out like what else is there to create, but also like how do we stay update up to date with the newest things? Um, and also how do we help designers, you know, facilitate their process of designing? And then we use all of that, then we create PCB with interconnection layers or interconnect between copper. Um, so yeah, so over here on the left is the this uh, that version of a footprint, like actually on Altium. So this is what we see is my symbol, PCB footprint to 3D model, and this is what you have your chips on your breadboards. So we're gonna run through this really quick because we're limited on time. All right, so just follow with me. So a pad is exposed region of metal on a PCB that the component lead is soldered to. So that was your chip earlier. You know, you know what soldering is. So this, these little intersections, these little pads, these pinouts of the component are pads. They're consisted of just basically exposed copper on the board so you can solder it in. Um, then we have through hole versus surface mount. Through hole is uh, usually if you're, unless you have some experience about getting onto like a fabrication or not fabrication or onto like a test lab, you can do more surface mount stuff. Usually what we'll see is through hole in the beginning of our careers uh, because it's that's how you can get more into surface mount. Surface mount is like a whole situation when it comes to soldering, when it comes to reflow, all that stuff. So through hole is inserted through the board, surface mount mounted onto the surface. Very fair of itself. Um, vias are conducting um, holes, plated through holes, supported holes through the board um, that we see that can either connect all the way from top layer to bottom layer. It can be not plated, which means no copper in between. Usually we'll use not plated, for example, like for mounting holes, tooling holes, whatever it needs. Usually when you want interconnection between the coppers, you'll use plated through holes. You'll see like a blind, which means it'll see the top of the surface, it won't see the bottom. You'll have two different blinds. You have a berry, which doesn't see any form of the outside world, um, all that fun stuff. A trace. A trace is essentially uh, a connected path of copper that runs all over the board and they act as a connection between two points of the PCB. So for example, there's two nets, like they're both, I don't know, power. It's a terrible, whatever. Okay, a terrible, whatever. So you'll want like a, you want, because you'll have a power, for example, net over here, a power net over here. How do they actually work with each other? How do they connect, right? Otherwise you just have components existing that don't have connection, which is not the point of the PCB. Um, so you'll have a track or a trace, which is essentially a copper path. Um, a, nat, a rat's nest is a, a form of, um, it's a 2D form on your PCB software that shows the interconnection um, of different nets that you'll see from the schematic that are imported into the PCB and so, for example, it can be very minimal like this. It's just a few nets, but the crazier the PCB, the more advanced it is, the more more components it is. You'll like work on 5,000 plus components sometimes, even more and more. Um, then you'll like talk about so many different layers and there's so much, but example, it can be really big like on the right and really crazy and you just have to flesh it out. Um, a silk screen essentially is uh, in traces to define the reference designators, designators for PCB components, test points, warning symbols, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, the one thing that you should just keep in mind is that it has no conductivity. It's just for viewing reasons. Um, and sometimes, for example, you'll have no space to even use silk screen and you have to figure out from there, like, what do I do? Blah, 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 but it's just for viewing purposes. And you can put it only on top and bottom layer because obviously it doesn't make sense to put it in the middle. Um, you have a polygon pour or a copper pour. And this essentially is a huge copper pour that um, carries large power currents or as a ground connected area for providing electromagnetic shielding. If you don't know electromagnetic shielding, um, that's called EMI. Essentially, there is a bunch of signals going everywhere and it's infecting 
it's been, for example, something that EMI really touches on is lightning on a rocket because, for example, we're flying up, right? And then lightning blasts the rocket. Like what we don't want is that for the rocket to explode, right? So how do we shield it from any start, sort of high voltage, high current? Um, that's one example. Uh, so for example, on a PCB format, we'll have like different techniques so that um, lightning, if it lightning hits, we're shielding it by this certain circuit, blah, blah, blah. Um, so a copper pour is just to have that entire flesh of net on the board. Um, okay, I'm gonna do this quick. Okay, so DRC essentially is once you created all the entire PCB, there's certain rules, right? Because the manufacturer can't create everything. There's, um, and then now you're getting into like, how much are you willing to pay? Because the point of a design or a design is that you have your cost, your time, and your oh no, I forgot what that word is. Manufacturability? I don't know. Anyways, but essentially, um, you can't create everything. They can't create everything. They can, but you're gonna pay a lot more. Um, then how you're gonna minimize costs because the point is like how do we can how can we create the low cost, most reliable product, right? Because then we can use that money for something else. I don't know. Um, so then we have a DRC check to just make sure that we're compatible with um, the design for manufacturing, which is also a general standard, but also uh, connective to your manufacturer. And now, hopefully that was enough information. I know it was a lot. I believe in hands-on doing, obviously we're from Cal Poly. So uh, we're just gonna go straight into the design and unless Chris has anything to say, I believe we're gonna split now here from Altium to KaiCat. Vicky, yeah, that's uh, that's good, thank you. Uh, let me go ahead and just share one thing. Um, yeah. Vicky, if you can stop. So we can know, we'll, oh, know what we're doing sorry. today. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so this is, my fourth time doing this type of workshop and this time we're going to be doing a very simple circuit and if you have any uh, electrical expertise you'll probably recognize what this is uh this is basically just a simple circuit that powers an led and has a faster right so we want to kind of simplify the circuit construction part of this pcb design uh just so we can get to the later parts of it because the most interesting part is routing uh DRC and production. So that's what we're pr probably going to focus on. You can probably, uh, if you have uh, more complicated projects, like you're building a robot, for example, you might have more components, but the concepts, the fundamentals we teach you today should still be the same. Uh, now, I wrote out these steps on a document. So if you're a text-based learner, after the workshop, you can go ahead and reference this uh, to guide yourselves through the KiCad portion. Uh, I don't think there's an Altium portion of this because I'm mainly KiCad, but today all we're going to do is put down at least five components on the board. I think it's actually exactly five components. We have a terminal block connector for external power, a push button for user input, a resistor, a LED, and a capacitor. That's five components. And then we put in the power, we put in the ground, and just make the circuit and be done with that. So our hope today is for both of us, KiCad and Altium, to get to the end of this PCP production uh, stage so that you can see what it's like to design a very simple PCB. And then our hope is that in the future, when you have more complicated parts, you can go on and expand on these simple steps. All right. So now we're going to break off into two rooms. Um, can I get a show of hands of who is doing the Altium workshop? One, two, three, four, five. What? One, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, are, are the rest of you KiCad? So just raise your hand for KiCad. Okay. Can we keep PyCat in this room then? Yeah, there we are. Okay. So if you are a uh, part of the KiCad workshop, you're going to stay in this room. If you're an alt team, you're going to go to the next room over. All right. And then on Zoom, if you're for KiCad, um, I believe you will stay in the main room. And for, oh, sorry, for Ki for alt team, you're staying in the main room. For KiCad, you're going to go into the breakout room. Can you create a breakout room? All right. Everyone got it? And could you please uh, give all your PCB prototypes back to the uh, front of the room, please? If you're interested in um, building one of those uh, PCB with a 3D printed part underneath, you can come to our soldering workshop, which is in three weeks, I believe. I do have to take a quick question. Yes. How much do those boards cost to make? So if you order from China, they're kind of dirt cheap. I think this board was about a dollar, but the shipping will kill you. Um, so I believe the shipping on five of these boards is about $30. Okay. 
from China. But the boards are dirt cheap. Uh, you can also get them produced from American companies, um, and it kind of balances out. Uh, these are more expensive from, let's say, Osh Park. It's about $9 or $10 from Osh Park, but the shipping isn't that expensive because it, it's produced domestically. So really, uh, pricing-wise, it's a balance between shipping and actual board cost. Oh, uh, and if you get produced in America, of course, the quality is going to be a lot higher. So if you're doing something like with RF, for example, you're going to get a lot cleaner uh, connections and production. Yes. Are there any uh, machines you can buy that pay them? I, you have $10,000 on hand? Sure. <laughs> yeah, the machines that make these are quite expensive and not for hobbyists. Yeah. Yes. I see online you can do them with like a, a CNC router, but they're not going to be like the same quality. It's going to be like one sided. Yeah. Down. You can do it with a CNC router too if you buy like big copper plates and then you just drill out the routes yourself. Yeah. So let's say I, I know where, the, where there's a CNC router. Uh huh. Uh, do you have any recommendations on how to do it? I believe, um, actually, Cal Poly does have a CNC router somewhere that was used to make PCBs. Um, but it's a whole other process. I'm not going to discuss it. We, we can talk later, Chase, if you are interested. But there's I've done it before. There's one of the maker studios I have. Yeah, I, I've I've done the CNC rounding PCB design before. I that's there's a reason I don't do it anymore. <laughs> and I just so like no, order it myself. If you want to make like quantity, you can. I mean, like, um, but again, making it from a CNC router is a little bit inaccurate. Like, if you don't get like the calibration of the machine just right, sometimes you can get like unexpected shorts or connections that you know aren't connected on the PCB. Okay. It's a little more difficult if you want to make it yourself. Okay. I think with all things in engineering, if you throw money at the problem, it solves itself. <laughs> it's just like the money aspect that we lack most of the time. All right, are we ready? All right, so Altium, if you're doing Altium, go ahead and move to the next room now. For KiCat, we'll start with the tutorial in about now. In about now. Yeah. Yeah. the breakout room. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'll. All right. On Zoom. Okay. Bye, Chris. Oh my gosh, my is just not working. No, things yeah. just keep on breaking. Okay. Adi, I'm gonna, Adi, I'm gonna need you to like Oh, I should just do it with them. Okay, I'm just gonna do it with you. Can you hear me? Did you say something? Can you hear me on Zoom? I can hear you. Okay. Um, on Zoom, if you're interested in Kai Kai, go to the breakout room, please. All right. Look. Bye, Chris. Bye. 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 No. Right. Um, can you Don't go. Oh. My heart. <laughs> All right, Vicky. Yes. Ready? Yes. Hello. Okay. Oh, you got quiet. Huh? Talk, 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 talking, talking. One, two, three. One of those I can't hear. Hello. Yosh, I can't hear you at all. Hello. Hi, now I can hear you a little bit.
back to the other wherever he is. Let me know whenever. Hello. Are you let me know when we're ready, okay? Yeah. I'm just gonna... Oh. <gasps> Chris. Yeah, Hi Chris. <laughs> oh, also, um, if any of you want to come to next week's, um, the deadline's right as soon as today. Make sure to do that. <laughs> next week is circuit, um, circuit construction. Thank you, but I just work. <laughs> All right, bye. No! <laughs> That's so mean. Oh, my heart. <laughs> That's so funny. Okay, I, think, I mean, Yash is still missing, but I think we're ready to start. Is Yash recording? I think Yash is recording. Yeah. What? So I think Yash is recording, so I don't know where he is, but ready to start. Okay. Is there a potential camera? If not, it's okay. We can just jump in. Oh, I have no idea. Okay. It's okay. No, that's too much work. Let's just go in. Um. Sorry? I said I see a camera here. It says how to just apply Fona, but I'm not sure I can mess it. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, I just want to make sure if there's questions I'm not running through. We can start? Is that what you said? Yeah, yeah, we can start. Oh, okay, okay. Let me, I can, I can barely. Okay. I can't really hear you either. So if you have something to say, don't say it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Come up to the podium or something. I can't, I can't hear. Um, oh yeah, I can, I can barely hear you. I can see everybody now, but I can't really hear, so. It's okay. It's very quiet even there, but okay. Let's just all right. I just want to make sure I'm not skipping any questions that are going on. Um okay. Hello everybody. I think there's like uh I can't see like seven, ten people. Um first of all, who has done PCB design? One, two. Two, three, four, three. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's, like, that's so funny. All right, so two or three people, that's really good. Um, I think because we have a bit of time till eight, so I just wanna kind of do a little deeper dive into PCB design. Um, the way I would describe PCB design is essentially you're creating a puzzle without actually knowing what the end puzzle looks like, 
But the best part is that you don't know because now you can design your own thing, right? Uh, it's nice because it expands. I really like PC design and the reason why I went to it, into it is because I think engineering is great. I do see that I don't have the most head straight down engineering mind and I really like art. I really like business. And I was like, you know, what is the actual intersection that I can look into that films, both of them, all of them together, which I think is, you know, we don't settle for low expectations. So this is my expectation. I went towards this route and now I really like it because basically like you do have to have a sort of creative mind. It's really interesting because the, the aesthetic of the layout actually kind of has some sort of connection to the electrical uh, efficiency of the layout. So there's like this one joke also in general that so Steve Jobs, like when it comes to PC design, um, PCB design back in the early ages, he was he had the, his PCB running. It was great. It was like super efficient, I believe, super reliable. But he actually was like, no, we're scrapping all of them. I don't care if we produce any of them. They don't look good because I want someone to be able to open up my phone, look at it and be like, this is beautiful. And it works like you have all of the ABC aspects of it. And so he actually scrapped all of them, went back, has a very beautiful layout of the PCB design of the motherboard. Um, I don't know where it is now because. Yeah. So, um, so it's really interesting. So if you do like that intersection of engineering and art, but also in general, you do have to have a good, to get more advanced, you have to have a good electrical background. So um, I think you have a degree and then also you're going towards PCB design. That's really interesting. Uh, I actually looked up also, the last thing is to, is the stats of PCB designers. It's really interesting because we really need PCB designers, but about 50, 50 to 70 percent are one above 50 year, years old, two are looking to retire very, very soon. So the market for PC designers is actually going to be rapid scaling. I think in terms, if you want to talk about salary wise in just one year, I think I've seen quite a weird change. I think not because I've been like kind of looking. It's just it's just interesting, like not many people one know about PC design because it's not taught in college. Right. Two, it's like you, the way you become a good PC designer is through experience. If you don't have experience and they're not teaching you in college. The only way you can do it is through your job or through projects like Chris, right? But then at that point, now you have to scale up to higher circuitry. And what are you gonna, you know, have the money to fabricate your own board at home? You're gonna probably have to do it under a company or do it under like a startup, whatever. Um, because that's how you become a good piece of designer. Because like, for example, maybe Chris might create RF, but it's like, like you don't, like it's gonna be a lot of money. Um, it's gonna, it's gonna be a lot of money because you're gonna go through a bunch of revisions, revisions, revision. Um, so it's really interesting because you learn through your job and usually PCB designers don't become PCB designers until they're like a little bit far into their career, which is quite sad. So it's really great that you guys are here, basically to say. So let's just jump into the design. Um, does everybody have Altium downloaded? Who, wait, first of all, better question. Who does not have Altium downloaded? Everyone does. Okay. Number two, if you do not have the library loader, don't worry about it too much. We, with the new circuit, we're not going to use it. Um, uh, so essentially, just to mainframe though, if you guys are going to move forward from this workshop and create your own designs, the library loader is this really, really, really neat script that someone posts online. And essentially, it's it allows you to access a database of, of a bunch of footprints that are created. So let me scale back and say that softwares generally have component footprints, right? But the problem is that when you have a unique component that you want to use, if it's not inside that database that they automatically give to you, you're gonna to have to create it yourself, which means now you have to understand how to create a good footprint that, or the correct footprint. There is a correct footprint. There is a right answer in this one, which sadly enough, yes, you have to make sure you know completely from end to end. Um, and let's say you don't create the right footprint. Now you're gonna have, you're gonna, say, okay, maybe it'll work. You'll print it out, doesn't work. Now you're wasting money, right? So it's nice that, that someone actually like open source all these footprints. Now you can use it, like you can probably like pull it up, look at whatever component manufacturing number you have, look at it, and then you just bring it into your design. And the best part about it is that it's very almost universal towards a bunch of PC design softwares. Um, Altium is a big one. 
so to scale it up, like usually your free software is like KiCad and free or EDA, Easy EDA. Um, those are free, but when you scale up to more than two layer boards, uh, they're not the best capable softwares. Then you'll get into Eagle, Cadence, uh, Pads, Menta Graphics, Slash Expedition, Altium Designer, so many different variabilities. Something I would think about is that all softwares are quite different when it comes to job searching. They're going to ask like, okay, maybe you're not Altium, but you don't know Cadence, and that's going to be a learning curve for us. So that's something we want to keep in mind. So the more you can touch on different softwares, the better, you know, opportunities you do have. Um, but that does cost a lot. So I think the best part about being in school right now is that you have free software. Actually, right before this, I was like, oh, no, I'm not a student anymore. <laughs> I don't have that software. So I do have it. I found a loophole, but we will not talk about that today. So <laughs> um, let's jump right in. So if you want to open up your Altium Designer, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so let's just hide this, hide this. Yash slash, slash, slash Addy, if you see a question, please let me know because I see three people, but let me know. Otherwise, I'm going to run through this. All right. All right. So you have essentially look at this i'm gonna hide that <laughs> okay so um you have pretend like this is your your all team it'll explode up then you have nothing on there right so what you want to do is you want to go to file new start project okay we're gonna start a project you're gonna name it whatever you want i did hyperloop pcb ah. 2023, and I'm going to put a one on it because I already have the original document. We're going to press create. So there's an empty, which is under PCB on multi board. We're not going to play with this one today. We're just going to go towards PCB. Create. Okay, is everyone following me so far? We're good? Okay. So what you do have, there's a bit of a learning curve. So just follow with me. Up here, you have your little, I forgot what they're called, but task bars. Um, file, edit, view, we'll get into that because I'm touching a PC right now. So there's these things called panels. So on your top, bottom right corner, it says panels. You're gonna blow that up. There should be a bunch of different things up here. What you're gonna want to bring up, let me just close everything so it looks like I have nothing. Panels, projects. So the project panel, will show you all the product projects that are open on your software right now. Um, and so you'll you'll see Hyperloop PCB or your project that you, you named it, and it's going to be there, right? But there's no documents added. So what do you do? You right click, add new to project. So what does a PCB hold, right? The a general, the basics of a PCB is that you have a schematic circuitry that is able to have interconnectivity to the actual 2D layout form, which is a PCB, a printed circuit board. So you're gonna need both. And then we'll go jump into more after that. Okay, so, but that's like for now. Um, add new to the PCB schematic. See, you're gonna see your schematic document right here. Um, you're gonna right click again, add new to PCB, and, or not, add new to project PCB. Okay, is everyone following so far? Good. All right. So um, we're going to talk about how the location repository works. So essentially, oh, it looks so weird right now. Um, a pre project PCB exists in a, uh, can either exist in a flat form or a hierarchical form. Um, what I mean by that is, for example, this is a hierarchy, right? Because these two documents exist under source documents. The source documents exist under the project PCB. So these two documents won't exist in any of the other project PCBs. They only exist under this project PCB because the project PCB holds all the documents under that project. Um, this is called a flat schematic document. There's nothing inside. Well, there's nothing inside right now, obviously. Um, for example, if I placed a sheet symbol, 
a sheet symbol uh, or a sheet entry essentially means that this schematic document is going to connect to another document, right? You can't fit a whole motherboard onto one schematic document, maybe some other lifetime. I have not seen that yet. <laughs> Because, I mean, you could if this mag document was like huge, but then you have to print out literally onto a physical format, something huge if you need it. Well, the manufacturers will need it. So um, that's a different conversation we'll get into right now. This is flat. There's only one. There's nothing existing in it. And there's nothing going to be existing with it, like connecting to another schematic document. So we're going to jump into this. The first thing you want to do right now is because the project's not saved what's going on is that it's not recognizing it's recognizing that there's two documents there but they're not together they're not linked together so you want to do just like a save <laughs> and it's you, a, what a good convention is to just like write with the actual can, uh, you can write circuit i don't know whatever you want but there is you will get into your company's um formatting naming you're going to save this one again sometimes companies will just write pcb dot pcb doc you could write some some companies will literally write the project like that and say that's the pcb doc for this project there's only one pcb doc per project technically usually i haven't worked with uh actually using the 3d application of like there's different projects, for example, it'll be like a baseboard, right? And then this is the PCB document, but maybe the, or PCB, but maybe there's a, a sister board that connects over to that. Sometimes you just do it in real life, but sometimes they want to see like, is it for sure going to interconnect? And they'll do this whole 3D CAD situation on Altium Designer to showcase that, but we don't need that today. So. We're going to go back to this circuit schematic documents. Um, sorry, we're good. OK, so we're going to play around with the actual tool in the first case. We're about 7 o'clock. That's good. OK, um, so this is so we're going to start with the panel. So this is what you touched right now, right? So this is the projects panel. Let me move this over here. Um, open up panels again. Uh, so when you're in the schematic document, the panels are specifically for the schematic document. The panels are specifically for the schematic document when you're on the schematic document, specifically different if you're on the PCB design document or PCB doc, right? Um, so we're gonna just take a look really quick. So components, you wanna press that. Um, raise your hand if you don't have, oh, let's not look at that. <laughs> if you don't have the integrated libraries in here. If you don't have it, so we can get yeah, some two help. People who don't, three people who don't. Four people. Okay, can you guys go help them? You just have to route to the directory and then add it. So you press right here, uh, file based library preferences, and then you'll add the. You need to uh, look at the path that it's connected to and then add it in. So you press install, I believe. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yes, I don't want to mess anything up right now, but can you help them with that? Um, so we're going to close it. So these two are the natural integrated libraries, int lib integrated libraries, that are directly with the software. That's really useful. However, it has limitations. Um, it doesn't have the most it doesn't have every component, obviously. It has like just like your generic, generic resistors, LEDs, very small or like headers, very simple, basic things. These are the Symaxis PCB libraries and Symatic libraries, um, which are different because those are from the library loader that we were talking about earlier. Um, but we won't get into that. So as you can see, there's a schematic library and the PCB library. The schematic library exists of the schematic symbols. The PC library consists of the PCB footprints slash 3D models, but they're integrated together. So that's what in lib is as well. They're like already together. Um, this is the schematic Symaxis libraries are a little bit stretched away. You should put those together. Huh? Yeah, kind of. 
someone who doesn't have those um, libraries, like it doesn't show them in the installer that you were showing. So I don't know what to do with that. Okay. Um, I would take a look at, uh, did Chris send you the uh, download to Altium? There's like a, okay, well first, so if you press this file based library, it's not here. No, no, it's not here, no. Okay, so what you need to do is route to the, the document or the, the file location that where, um, where your Altium is, your Altium software is, and then you go to, I believe there, and then there's a library. There is a, let me send, this. I'm going to take a second. Um, okay. Um, pause sharing. Give me a second. I believe there was a thing that Chris sent. I don't see it. Or is it on Hyperloop? I'm sorry. I can't hear you. I haven't seen any links from the Hyperloop server. The Altium Designer Installation Guide, it's not in there? Not, that one's there, yeah. On. Yes. Okay. Give me one second. I need to turn on the light because it's getting dark over here. Um, Okay, all right. Hopefully, you guys. Essentially, yeah, you just need to find the location. So find the location that's in, and then press install, and and you have to point to that library, and then open, and it'll exist in there, I believe. Um, okay, I'm gonna move forward just because I want to make sure we get through this. Um, so. What we have is, uh, so you have your panels, right? So you have these two libraries. So let's take a look at what they have. Um, so this is the mis miscellaneous devices, your devices, your passive components, um, active, everything. Uh, it can go from diodes to inductors, to LEDs, to MOSFETs, all the fun stuff, switches, However, obviously, this is not the world's entire component da database library, right? But it is really good for simple projects like we have today. We have your connectors, all the miscellaneous connectors. You have a bunch of different headers, different formats, rows, columns. Um, and yeah, so that's your components panel. You have your manufacturing part search. Um, for example, if you wanted to look up a specific part, we can look on there. The manuf manufacturer part search connects over, I believe, to like databases like, or like to manufacturing um, websites like DigiKey, uh, I believe. I haven't really used this because we've just created our own footprints. But I'm sure you can play around with it and it'll show like, how, oh, I do know that it shows like how much it costs, where you can buy it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's that, uh, okay. Uh, let's look at all the important ones. Projects, properties. So properties are essentially everything about the document. So right now I'm touching the document. So these, this is the properties for selecting the document. Um, and it'll generally show your selection filter. So like if there's a component on here, I can select it. If I turn off the component, I can't select it. You can't see it right now because we have no components. Um, I'll show that later. Generally, it'll show like the grid that you're on there is a difference between imperial versus metric. Uh, they're generally the way we, hmm, it's an interest, it, uh, an industry standard you have to comply by. Um, interestingly enough, aerospace is moving from imperial, which is mils, a thousandth of an inch, to millimeters. Um, so that's really interesting. Definitely a weird knowledge game changer um but that's what it is some people yeah 
I don't know, it's different. So right now this page is on mils. Uh, you can change to millimeters over here. You can also do it by pressing, oh, no, okay. We'll get into shortcuts soon. Um, your page options is your formatting your size. You have different templates. Uh, so as you can see, the schematic document change. You have different, um, you can use like a standard format sheet size. The standards are like A or B usually in the US, which is eight, 18 by 24. I just learned this. <laughs> All right, but um, so you have a title block, which is what you see down here. Usually you'll need a title block to showcase like what is the PCB, who created it, what revision are you on? Um, is this a fab board? Uh, what well, is a fab board? But like um, different, different numbers pertain to the fabrication and to the assembly. We won't get into that. That's just a note to keep. Um, so you can really optimize the software, use it to your advantage, right? It's a tool. So yes. Um, we've got someone you said um, in libraries, there, the file should be there, right? If you have to that is in, in your, your file store. Yeah, it should be connected to your file explorer yeah. somehow. If you've got someone who opens up the library folder and there's no files in there, was, would that be a reinstall? Open up a library, but there's no they files. Open up the library folder, yeah, in the in their file explorer, but there's no files in there. Would they need to reinstall the program? No, no, no. That means you need to integrate. You need to install the the library onto the software, and it's going to show up inside the software. I believe. One well, should show up in the file explorer too. Not Try that first. Huh? They're not even there in the file explorer. They're not yeah, even in the library right. folder itself. In the installation like area. Yeah, there's just no files there. Hmm. That is weird. Um, okay. Have first of all, did you follow the the Altium setup that we have on the document? Okay, and it just, okay, yeah, maybe, that's weird, maybe, yeah, maybe a restart, hmm, I'm not sure, I can't, I can't test it right now. I'll just look for a download online or something for now. Okay, okay, or in the meantime, yeah, maybe look at each other's, um, to take a look at that, okay, so, that's that your schematic filter we won't get into that um so over here so let's let's just start creating the project right um so how do we do that let's go to components you have your connectors and you have your devices so i have already created it over here so i'm just going to showcase that so how do we find pretend like nothing's here three here well let's go here okay so let's play with the first one how do we find your capacitor components panel um, what is capacitor? Is it a device or connector? Not a trick question. It's a device. All right. So let's go to your capacitor. Over here, obviously, you can see capacitor. Cap is the ID name for it. Cap capacitor. What you do is left click, grab on. So then you have your component. This is called component. This is the ID number. This is a reference designator. And this is the value. Your schematic symbol is integrated to your pcb right so what you'll see on the pcb is your reference designator um and all of that information points what are you sorry something right now are you sure we can't oh anything? oh my goodness <laughs> that's oh it's because it wasn't shared what you guys are saying nothing i'm so sorry all right <laughs> Uh, I was talking this entire time and we just, oh my goodness. Okay. Does everyone understand the panels part at least? If you don't understand it, raise your hand. All right. I only see three people, so sorry. <laughs> um, okay, so let's go on to components. So what we're doing right now is creating, oh my gosh, I didn't show anything. Okay, whatever. Um, panels, bottom right, components components, right, are your libraries. Um, so we're going to start creating the circuit. This is a circuit that you can create. 
Hopefully, Addy or Yash can point that out. All right, let me. Oh, this is my certification, guys. Okay. Vicky, what are you pointing out? And it's this. Uh, well, I'm just going to put this on um, our Discord. So it's just easy for everyone to look at. Um, so this is the the schematic we're going to be, or circuit that we're going to create. So basically, the person I have nothing. How did I add this into here? Miscellaneous devices over here. We want a capacitor over here. Something to keep note of is uh, the footprint, right? So this is a through hole, like we were talking about earlier. There's pins that go through the hole. You might be most familiar with this. Then you have, I don't see. Oh, this is so, oh. So this is a uh, surface mount. See, it's like the components like mounted to the surface, this copper area, there's no holes in it. Um, so you want to keep that in mind when you're selecting your components. But so we have this. So how did I switch that? You press space bar and that's how you rotate. Right. You're going to place it down, left click, place down. Um, and then so let's just start creating. So you have your cap. You don't need to change the question mark. I'll show you a neat trick later. Let's get our resistor. Scroll down. Resistor. Axial 0.3 pin inch spacing over here. You can see in the footprint the 0.4 inch spacing um, depends on your use case of the product. I'm gonna put that there. These are obviously, oh man, these are not the values that we want. I will retract that from the server. We'll figure that out later. Okay, you want an LED. I believe I chose the, this one. We're going to add that in. Something you want to keep in mind is this grid, right? I don't know if you can. It's dim on mine. It might be not even apparent on yours. On your software, you can see like these very thin grid lines. You can change it by uh, um, on your properties panel. If you select this, you can change the grid. You can also change the color. Um, something to note is you do want to be like, you don't want like a random 0.5 grid. Might make, there's a bunch a bunch of issues. The same way this, where software works where it's like, oh my gosh, I forgot to add one semicolon or forgot to add, or this line just messed up everything. The same thing kind of goes here. If there isn't a specific wiring to that, pin line, it will mess up everything because it's not going to import correctly. So you really want to make sure that things are connected correctly. So let's add your LED. We have our switch. It is here as well. What is that? Switch. Is this one? Yes. Switch. Press button. We'll put that there. You have your header, which is uh, that's a connector, not a device. Over here, which one? So usually Chris used a terminal block. We don't have terminal block here, but we have spacing. That's what's important. What did I use? Uh, what is this? If you double click on your left button, it'll pop up the panel, right? Because earlier what we saw right now, so like I'm pressing the document, it's giving you the properties for the document. I click the component, you see that it changed it. That's the properties for the component. The component properties shows everything. It has your designator, your comment. This is your comment down here. Description of the component or whatever it is, where it's sourced from, the location that exists on the on the board or on the schematic document or whatever whatever document. The footprint. You can have a bunch of different. This is only one footprint. Um, I'll show you a footprint. Sometimes it'll have a 3D model if you have a 3D model, um, and then kind of what pertains to it. The pins as well, and you can kind of play around with that. So that is that. This, if I press this, this is the header two. Header two. Two. Two H. That is different. That is not what we want. Um, I 
if you find it before me oh, over here or two one by two i don't know what the spacing of what chris wants is but we're just going to do the design we're not fabricating yet <laughs> until we fabricate we'll figure this out um okay so is everyone following so far any questions amazing all right so what we need to do now is the wiring so if you don't have this little area right here that is okay these are shortcuts to what you'll want to use if you go to place there's a bunch of different things that you want to use right so let's just actually just walk around because now we have all the components on here okay for edit you have a pace smart pace we'll get into that later you can break a wire you can select deselect areas it's really interesting we'll talk about that soon um you have a view you can view the document the document see the entire thing how I'm doing this, like scrolling in and out. If you do have a mouse, this is probably gonna be the best situation for you. You can't, this is a joke, but truly though, it is really hard to be a PC designer without a mouse. <laughs> you need a mouse. Um, so I'm like pressing into the, I'm pressing into this scroll button and then pushing it forward. And that's what's driving this zoom in, zoom out function. If you don't, you can also just press control and then wheel in, wheel out. How I'm moving across a document is pressing the right click button and moving it around um, with, if you have just a laptop, two fingers scroll up and down. Um, oh yeah, and then like zoom in, zoom out is like, you know, what you would think it would be, so. That is that. Oh, <laughs> sorry. I don't know how to, I don't really use the, yeah, I don't ever use it. It's just like also your fingers over time. We age quickly, guys. You gotta <laughs> be careful. Um, okay, so then we'll go to projects. There's a bunch of different things here. What we did earlier was add new to project. You saw the schematic document, PCB. You can add existing if your PCB document is located somewhere else. Um, and we'll touch all this later. Place is what we're going to be using right now. So as you can see, there's like this W over here. This is a shortcut because otherwise I have to go like literally bring my mouse over here, play, play, or press place and then press wire. And you'll see this little cross thing with my mouse. But I could also just press W and then it automatically pops up. So how do you do this magic? You'll press whatever command so this actually works with anything any of the um commands that exist on altium i believe i don't think you can do it with this one. Oh my gosh you can cool i don't use it for that obviously it's not you want to use shortcuts for things that you commonly use because the keyboard is obviously so limited you can't do everything with it um so for example if i want to do something for net label so right now as you see there's like a, a line under the letter and then a, a line under the next letter. Obviously, that's the shortcut. So you press P and then press N for net label. Or you can just press Control onto whatever thing that you want. Press Control, left click. It'll pop up as edit command. And then um, you can put a shortcut here. So like, let's say N. There's nothing used right right now, right? So essentially, if I press OK, I press N. It'll automatically go to the command for me. But for example, if I press W, it's already in use by the wire. I haven't really messed with the what happens if they both have it. I think it'll, it'll still let me, but it's going to be a problem. So we're not going to play around with that. Oh, see, backspace even is a button of itself, right? So like you will, every button is important. Let's go into connecting it. I'm going to press wire, select. You'll see this red cross section. That's when you know it's touching the wire. Like if you, how I let go of that is you right click. Right, or you can press escape too. And that's what happened. Um, wire, select left, press. You see that red? Otherwise, it's gray, right? Because it's just connecting to whatever. Um, red. And then you right click to deselect, or you can press escape. Okay, so we're going to do the next one wire, add, wire, add deselect on the right. 
wire add, deselect, right click. So this is the fun part because now if I go this way, you see the wire is going back on itself. We don't want that. That is a short. So what you can do is you can press space bar. Do you see how it like changes the orientation by 90 degrees? That's 90 degrees. Okay. So, or you can just literally press on the grid. It'll automatically create a temporary line and you can still press space. So just be careful with that. You're going to press again to wherever you want to connect it. Let's press one more time. Over here and over here. So these are nodes. Nodes are the interconnect between certain wiring. Um, as you can see here, there's no specific node, right? Is everything okay? Are we good? Okay. Um, so now we have the circuit. What is the problem comparing these two? We don't have a ground. It needs to be, there needs to be relativity. Um, I want to show you guys. It was quite interesting. Oh, there you go. Um, okay, so this kind of goes with the, with what's going on, hopefully. Oh, no. <laughs> you can't. Oh, why did I pin it? All right. Well, okay. I can't show it because I don't know how to take off this right now, which is kind of silly. Uh, take off my, okay. So this is essentially like the easiest way to think about it because you have your battery and you have your light bulb, right? But it needs a ground connection over to connect at the same time the signal's going back up this way. So there's a return path and that's your ground. So you need a ground basically. There needs to be a return path for every signal, whether that means for the actual signal itself, whether it's a differential pair, which we'll talk maybe in the next workshop about. So um, signals traveling on PCB traces also return to their source on adjacent return planes or return signal um, signals. So I think that's an, a good way to think about it. They want to gravitate or work together because if it's like going this way and this way is going this way, it's like we can't really talk, you know? So you want them, you want them to be able to talk. Anyways, that's a kind of ground. Okay, so we're gonna add a ground. How I did that is this little shortcut right here, and also press place power port ground. Um, as you can see, if I press ground here, oh, no, properties. So you press power port, then it's showing ground. You can change it to like whatever you want, circle. That's not common, right? You can do this one. Power ground is the most common. Um, yeah. And so, what's the next problem? This is wrong too. We don't have the, we don't have the values. So let's go find some values. This is all right. So we have a ten microfarad and ten k resistor. How do you do that? You press. Maybe on this one. You press left click. Um, where's my 1K? What? Oh, value. So down here, it says value. I'm going to change it to 10K. Obviously, so it's it's different if we would be uh, if we would be using a different. So there's a fabricator and there's assembly, right? Um, so your fabricator essentially creates the PCB, uh, the actual PCB. So that's like with no components on it. That's what a fabricated board means. An assemb assembled board means that. So basically, I'll give the PCB designer will give the K the CAD drawings to both of them. But what's essentially happening first is that it's going to move to the fabricator. The fabricator is going to compress all those core copper layers together. They're going to fabricate the board. They're going to create the copper interconnections within the board. And then they'll create the silk screen, create the legend. They're going to do all that. You're going to fabricate it. Now I just have this green slab. But I'm like, well, I need to, I need, you know, components on the board. So then the fabricator will push it over to the assembly. And then we'll run through an S&T line. Um, or whatever way you're going to assemble the board. You can assemble it yourself. There's manual assembly. There's 
automatic assembly. Um, that's a different conversation. Then we'll go to the assembly house. So there's different, there's a fab house, assembly house, sometimes they're together, it depends. Um, so that's that. So right now we're not worried because this is a 10K ohm because in this idea that we're doing right now, we're gonna be assembling our own boards, right? So we're just like, well, we need a 0.3 inch pin spacing. That's what we know. And then we know the, the component that we have at home to solder onto the board. So that's good enough, right? So I can change it. And I say that my 10K resistor has a 0.3 inch. I can change it to 10K, 1K, whatever, whatever it is. Um, over here for the capacitor, same situation. We have a 10 microfarad. So 10, we're gonna change this over here, 10 microfarad. So if you see over here, it'll be an interesting little play. So this eyeball means you can see it. Turning it off, it's dimmed. I can't see it on there, right? It's like not there anymore. So you can lock it, which means I can't change it. I can't, like if I press this, I literally cannot change the value. I can unlock it, that's for, Sometimes it gets confusing when a bunch of different people touch boards. Um, that's the most I can say. Okay, so also something interesting is if you select from left to right, it will only grab whatever is inside the selected box. So as you can see, it selected everything that was inside the box, right? But let's say I select halfway through this LED it won't select, oh, it did select the LED. Why did it select the LED? Yeah, so that was like kind of halfway. If I select from right to left, that's like everything that's touching. So you touch this header, but if I like, start in the middle of the header from left to right, it won't select this header. So that's really interesting, something to play around with. Um, and what you have right now is you have these question marks, right? So how do you annotate it? Like you want specific reference like meters, like one, two, three, because like this is switch one. This can't be switch one, two, because there's two components on the board. How are they both switch one? What you do is go to design. Oh no, sorry, tools, annotation, annotate schematics quietly. Instead of what you gener generically do is you go here, you go to your properties panel, I'd scroll all the way up. I have to go to the designer, press it, press two, and then for example, yay, it's done. But now I have to do that manually with every single thing. No. Okay. So how we'll do that. Also, it gets confusing because sometimes there can be so many components on the board. You don't want any problems, especially when you start design. So you're going to press tools, annotation. See, so it says there's four designators requiring updates. See what changes. One, two, three, four. Yes. Ta-da! And it's done. Now we can do the fun stuff. I'm going to delete this. Okay, so big, big, big thing about Altium is Altium is terribly buggy. That's really sad. So, which means if you're in the middle of design and you don't save, all that work's gonna be gone. So many horror stories of doing five plus hours of work, never saving, and just completely all gone. So remember to save all the time. Now, let's go to your schematic document projects panel, open your PCB doc. I'm gonna close this project. Oh, okay, I'll just leave it. Um, I'm gonna change all this, take this out. Okay, so your project should look like this. It's just like a black, this is your PCB, and we'll talk about it later. So what you wanna do now is to have the connectivity between your schematic document to your PCB document, right? So you have your design, import changes. Okay. So you have uh, design important changes. So you want to be cognizant of the fact that there's an update schematics and there's an import changes. Update schematics is that you're pulling from the 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 project over to schematics from import changes from schematics to your document. So we're gonna press import changes. We're gonna take a look, take a look at the ECO, your engineering change order. So you have these five components that you want to add on, that's correct, right? There's these pins. Okay, I, I trust Altium and I trust what I did on the schematic document. And then it's going to add these component class numbers. Essentially, these component components have classes to them. They're going to be added onto the board. 
something to keep in mind is right now we're okay. We have five components on the board, not so crazy. Some that some problems that happen is like what I said earlier, there might be a quiet connect that's not actually what you want it to be. Sometimes people will need to like have to specifically look at what's going on in your ECO because you don't want any problems. Um, and sometimes there's gonna be errors. So very important to look at the ECO. You can validate changes first. I just go straight in with execute. Validating is like, we'll show in a second, I'll press execute. Validating is just showing that the status is like correct, we're green, no problems, no red. Execute is like, let's just go with it. <laughs> so sometimes you'll go with it and there's gonna be X's and like, oh man, you gotta redo it. But today is an okay day to do that. So let's close. Now you have all these components on the board. Okay, what is the problem that's going on here? This is a fun game. If anyone can answer the question, let me know. Yeah, five seconds. So we don't have time. One, two, three. Sorry? There's not there's no room? Yeah. They're saying it's, there's no room. There's no room. Oh, that's a tricky answer. There is a room technically, but we'll get into that soon. Are you saying there's no room between the components? It's not on the PCV? Yeah. It's not on the PCV. Okay. Um, it's not that it's on, not on the PCB. So when you design import, good, good answer, first of all, but the thing is when you design import, what's happening essentially is that all these components from the schematic document are just pushed into the PCB document. They usually exist outside of this black area, which is the actual PCB, right? So there's no connection because the point of PCB layout is to create the connection. It's just showing this rat's nest. You see this little, little gray to gray area. See when I hover over it, it's like highlighting. Um, so it's showing, hey, I need you to connect these things together. They're not connected yet, but here, here are the components and here's what it should happen. Um, so what the biggest component when it, or the, the biggest proponent about PC design is that you always want to keep your end user in, in mind. Who is the end user or what is the end user? The end user is the person that contacts the board that tells you, that pays you money to create the board, right? My end user said, I don't want surface mounts. I only want the whole components. And the problem here, to be fair, I didn't completely say that, that we, the end user wanted that, but I did infer that we are doing um, through whole because we want, generally with this project, we want to be able to go home and solder it by ourselves. The problem here is that D1 is a surface mount. Um, this having through hole and surface mount components actually cause, like creates more cost issues. Um, just going through different production lines and well right now like surface mount also like at home soldering you can do might be a little bit harder. Something like the easy way to think about it is like this red pad here. The red means copper, right? because um, a pad is copper connectivity. How we can see that also is like, if you press three, the number three on your laptop, you can see this is a through hole. There's a hole literally through the board. I'm pressing shift and using my right mouse to move around. Um, and you can see that interesting thing here also is, I don't know if this, component has oh no oh 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 we didn't even look at panels okay so i'm gonna go back to two two is when you go back to your 2d format three was over in your 3d format so you have your properties here remember i said what i'm touching base on right now is that your panels for your pcb doc is so different from your schematic document right so you have um your properties board what other panels that you we're going to go through the most used ones, you have view configuration. This is one of the most important ones. So down here, you have all the different layers that exist on your board. This is the nice thing about different softwares, because depending on their advanced capabilities, they can one either hold a lot of different signal layers. 
So like, for example, easy EDA, I don't know if it expands more than two layers. I, I'm not sure. Kaika, I don't even know if it expands more than two layers. Um, Altium, I believe expands 18 plus. Expedition, which is under Mentor Graphics, expands like, oh gosh. That's like one of the most like, like that expedition by Mentor Graphics is like, if you really want a bunch of layers, right? So like, for example, like, um, I don't know, for something existing in the air, like satellites or whatever, whatnot, like there's gonna be so many proponents up there that we need to take account of, which means we need a lot of heat dissipation, something to think about. So, but then now you're driving, like, how much are you willing to pay? How much is your company willing to pay for this license? Because every license is so expensive. I believe LTM, oh, depending on your plan, can rack up to like 1K plus per person sitting in it, right? So it's like Netflix, like, <laughs> it's like, if you're on Netflix, so it's not directly correlated, but it's like, if I'm on Altium, you can't be on Altium, that's a seat driven. That means a thousand for me only. Um, but once I let go of the license, you can jump onto the license. So that's kind of how you play it. Um, and depending on what the end user wants, the end user being your company, the end user being your electrical engineer that's telling you that I want this board, it's like, okay, I'm gonna create what you want because that's my client. Um, so going back to the configurations, you have a two layer board here. We're gonna be working with a two layer board. Um, you have your component layer pairs. So your overlay is your silk screen. This is the yellow C1, R1. Um, your paste, paste essentially, you know, like solder paste, that's your paste layer. So if like, so a shortcut right now that we're gonna talk about is shift S. So that's one masking, shift S again, double masking. That's unless you can go. This is what is existing on the top layer. Bottom layer, I can press it too. It'll show me bottom layer, identical one, or shape, top layer, see so it shows top layer. If I press shift S again, it goes back to normal formatting. Um, uh, if you want to like, see how I'm like automatically doing this, how I'm doing that is a control shift with your mouse wheel, control shift, mouse wheel, and it's automatically going to the different layers. So what we're talking about is paste right here. So if I do a shift S, S, paste is, you know, for, I don't know if through whole components use it. I should know that. But for example, if you're doing SMT, which is your, um, your surface mount right here, for example, there's different uh, assembly lines that will go through reflow, right? For example, they'll like put this paste on it and then they're gonna reflow it. They're gonna put a bunch of heat so the paste like actually like heats up. Then when it's heated up, because right now it's just like a, 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 a solid form, it'll reflow, turn into liquid and then they can stamp it on, stamp the component on with a component or a chip hat shooter and then it'll go move, move forward. So um, that is paste, but we're gonna change that one later. Then you have your drill drawing, which is your dimensions for the fab houses. Um, and then a bunch of different situations that we'll talk about later. But what I wanted to touch on is your view options. Oh, because sometimes they'll show a 3D version of your component. So if I press 3D right now, there's no component on it, which means the schematic or the, the PC library is not, is, does not hold a 3D model, which means you can't see it, right? Um, mon yeah, see it's on right now. Show 3D bodies on, there's nothing there. Um, oh, maybe? Oh, that is so cool. All right. So this is a uh, uh, a 3D version of the board thickness, right? Because this is exactly what I'm talking about. Like this is a through hole via because they're connecting from bottom to top to bottom, right? So through the board, this is what it'll look like. This is what the inside of the board looks like. This is your core in the middle. Um, shift, right click is how I'm moving it around. On the top layer, you'll see you have your silk screen right here. It's just showing directly on there. Your surface mount is right here, this thing there. So that is so fun. Okay. Oh, and you can like, oh, this is so cool. Um, it's really interesting. One thing about piece design to always keep up about is that things are constantly, I mean, honestly with everything, everything is constantly changing. You wanna keep up with the new things you don't you want to continue continually be educated about what are the new technologies going on that's very important let me say that because i never use this little 3d thing 
Um, okay, so let's start creating the board. So this is a huge board, right? These are the only components that we want. Why do we want such a big board? It's gonna make us pay more anyways. We don't, we have different areas where we can put our money. So we want to create a board shape. This is the current board shape that we have. Um, we don't want that. So we're gonna go back to our layers and colors over here. There isn't a board shape layer. One thing to keep in mind is like, oh, mechanical one is open, right? You could use that. Problem with that is that if I shift S, I'm trying to see what's on, on, this, on this layer. There is something on this layer. Maybe I'm sure the, the fab house or assembly house is gonna use it. So I don't want to draw any wrong situations going on there. So what we're gonna do is you right click mechanical layer, add mechanical layer, call it board shape. That's the most standard generic form of it. Um, then press okay. Now you have your board shape layer. How do I specifically use that layer though? So I have to be on the layer to use, to, to input anything onto that layer. Um, so I mean, this is the board shape I did. I'm gonna delete it. See when I go, see it's different because left to right, it's only within inside the box, right to left is everything touching that box, touching that unit. I'm gonna delete, I just press delete button. So we're gonna create our board shape. Press place line. Same thing here, you can put that shortcut, the control left click, and press L, but this is already used by board layers. I don't wanna use that. Backface is already used. <laughs> so I'm just gonna cancel because I don't use line often. I don't want to waste any of my buttons on it. So you play it, uh, that's gonna select everywhere. So you see this white, white dots, those are grids. So it's going to automatically snap to it. Snapping is what it, what the word is. It's snapping to the grid. However, you can turn off the snap by going to properties and then you can say, I don't want grids on. I'm gonna turn it off. So let's say I just do that right now, right? So let's do place line. Look, it, it's literally not snapping to anything because I turn off the grid. So this is really important because for example, Maybe you're not bothered by it. The next person that might take over might be bothered by it because, and then also the, the connectivity that you have by trace is going to be bothered. The fab pass might be bothered as in you might not have good production of it. Um, so always following that. I always just turn everything on for the fun of it. <laughs> Let's do place line. I'm going to go like that. As you can see, the properties panel automatically showed up. This is showing a 10 mil grid. How I'm, how I'm um, same same uh, situation here for the zoom in zoom out control uh, control wheel or control or wheel in which might be a little chaotic so we do that so what you're seeing right now is a 90 degree angle right here right how do I change that because generically when you create lines or traces which are copper connectivities traces are copper connectivities right between nets. Um, there's things as a PC designer you need to know because, uh, for example, a 90 degree angle is one really bad for the signal itself because now it's like, oh, I'm gonna go over here. Oh shoot, I have to make a jump, go back up. But if you have a 45 degree angle, it has more smoothness to the connect or to the signal. Yeah, like um, sorry. Okay. Yeah, you're good. Okay, okay, now you're good. Um, but then also like specific copper, when it goes at a 90 degree angle, it can become an issue for EMI. It can become like if you have a whole copper pour out and then it has like a, a, a an angle right here, a bunch of voltage can sit in the 90 degree area, which becomes a really big problem for EMI, right? Because lightning is gonna want to jump directly there. We're like, no, we don't want you to jump anywhere, but we gave you space to do that. So something to think about. How do we change it from 90 degree? Shift, um, shift, uh, spacebar. Um, this turns it into a smooth edge, which is really good. I don't think there's a problem with it. I do hear that there are fabrication issues because as you can see, I can't like specifically, like it looks fine right now, right? But let's like zoom in a lot, 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 lot more. It, I believe it's fine, but I personally don't use it because I don't know. 
if you use a 45 degree angle, it just exists easier. But some people like, there's no problem with it. I don't know. I just heard different things and that's okay. So you can use this. Um, this is really, really bad. Don't ever use this. This is just a stranded, whatever the heck it wants to do. Don't use that. Um, because this is like, you know what I showed you in the photos of PCBs before, like you just like, they just try to attach it to the board. However, it's going to cause a bunch of manufacturing issues there. We don't need to dive into that. Shift S. So this is what I'm talking about, the 45 degree angle. But right now we want a board that is square. So I still could do this with this. So I'm going to go like that. So space bar is changing the different orientation of it. I want this way. I'm going to go up here. Space bar again. Over here. Here. Space bar. Oop. Remember to always left click, press it down. How I let go of that is a left a right click. Is everyone following so far? We're good? Okay, so I want everything to exist. Oh, we have 15 minutes. Oh goodness. All right. So we want all this black area to be the PCB. So I'm gonna select everything, tools. Oh, sorry, not tools, a uh, design board shape. Because I've selected everything, I'm going to press define board shape from selected objects. So I already selected it, right? Boom. Now, this is my board. So cute. It's too small. <laughs> oh, no. I'm going to redo this. Oh, sorry. Sorry, 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 sorry. Oh, how I did that is uh, select from right to left and then right click, move that over. Move that up. Or you could just drag it up, same thing. And how I'm thinking about that. So this is called a room. So whoever said room, there's no room earlier. That was actually a really funny answer. So this is a room. A room is a property of the schematic document that's imported into the Altium because everything that exists in that room or that schematic document is going to exist in this room in the PCB doc. So this little red thing is the room. So that means if I carry this out, it's still existing in the room because it's still in the schematic document that's connected to the room, right? So if I carry this entire room, it's going to follow with it, whatever dimension it's at, which can cause a numerous amount of problems. But however, if you train it well, and you recognize how it actually works, it can be very good use to you when you go into channels, when you go into, I don't know, a bunch of different use cases. So. Um, I'm going to make that a little wider. I think that's good. Okay, design, like I said, board shape, design select the objects. Something you want to note is this little little thing over here. What is that? That's an origin point. So your grid is defined, Is a, your grid is always basic, which means it has no tolerance, right? So this dot right here, it has no tolerance. And it's also inferring off of this origin point. So how do I reset it? Because this is so far, I want it like, I don't know, I want it closer. So you can do edit origin set. I'm gonna set it to the bottom left-hand corner. And now it's drawing off, the grid is drawing off of this left-hand corner, which is very useful for me. So now we're gonna get into design. Is everyone following? We have 10 minutes. All right, so I'm not gonna replace this right now for time situations but let's go into directly the design so this is generally the most basic way i can explain it what we do know is i have this terminal right i'm going to input voltage into the terminal and i want it to be moved around everywhere however the thing is that signals always have a return path so as you can see here there's your five volt and your ground which means they constantly kind of want to stay together right um but I do know that this is not going to exist in the middle of the board because I'm going to need to attach it to something, at least from what I think, what I know is what my end user wants, and I'm going to use it that way. What's the next thing I look at? I'm going to go back to the schematic document, and I'm like, okay, well, we're going to enter a switch first. So let's enter into the switch. Um, so I'm going to find my switch. Switch. What am I seeing? This five volt wants to connect over here because it's it's going from the terminal to the switch. Okay, I'm gonna change it. So left click, space bar, same situation from your schematic document. See if I hold it in the middle, it's pulling, wait, 
oh yeah, if I hold it from the middle, it's pulling from the middle location of the component. If I hold from the pad, it's moving, it's holding, changing base off of the origin of the pad, which is important, right? Because it's snapping to your grid. So that's really important. If you ever lose track and it becomes wonky, you need your arrow keys and it'll just like automatically snap. Here, it was snapping versus to the pin one. I want to stop the pin two because I want a direct line there. You have your switch, then you have your capacitor slash resistor. Okay, let's get our capacitor. This is a huge one. Whatever. <laughs> so we'll play around with that here. And then we're like, we want to add a resistor here. And then this guy wants to go here. Okay, so you start to kind of see what's going on. So this is like what your schematic document is saying, right? It's like, I want to plug from the left. It goes through the switch, it goes through the capacitor, it goes to the resistor and the diode. And each, each signal has a good return path because the ground is here. So essentially, if the easiest way I can show this is like, if you follow my mouse, we have a signal going this way and it's returning back this way. So the best thing about PC or the most important thing about PC design is that you want a very smooth signal. You don't want it to go whoop, 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 like around in multiple circles. I mean, maybe you do. Circles are good, right? But you don't want it to go like, sorry, you don't want it to go like this and up and then drag back and then this and drag down up like that. Like it causes timing issues. It causes impedance issues. Impedance essentially, um, oh, how do I explain this? Oh no. Okay, impedance. Like for example, you have like very uh, sensitive signals that want to travel with each other. And this data line needs to reach the end at the same time this data line reaches the end. However, if I have, for example, more copper, then this guy's gonna go a little slower, right? So like there's impedance issues with that. That's a whole conversation. That's why I don't wanna get into that right now. But this is what my schematic document is saying. However, there are fun little things about PC design that you should know, right? This circuit is probably not capturing a lot of current. It's not capturing a lot of voltage. So do I really need to use up all this space? Probably not. You can change it around, right? So like I can move this guy up here. I can move this guy down here, this way, this way. Look, the board's so much smaller and we have a bunch of unused space here so I can like Go like this, move it around, go like this. Maybe it doesn't have the best return path. The thing is, it's still gonna work. There's nothing specifically sensitive about this, so it's still gonna work, but you know, I'll just make it look nicer. Hey, so how do we, yeah? Um, I sent you on Discord a picture that's like someone's screen. Uh, it, it has a, it, it looks um, not like your screen though. They all, all look kind of green, with like some like meshing on them. Oh, okay, yes, yes, yes. So the problem with that, and this is why maybe your computers are running slow. I'm so sorry. <laughs> so there's things, right? It's a tool. Let's go. Let's go change our preferences. So Altium automatically loads up with things, and that's called your DRC scan, um, or your DRC design rule check, right? So it's like constantly doing real time checking, and it's like. You're gonna slow down your computer significantly, especially if you don't have a graphics card or it's like a just normal laptop. So you go tools, preferences. Let's turn that off. Right here, it's probably checked, uncheck that online DRC. Something interesting too that you might see that's going on in my display is that um, when I hover over something, it's highlighting. So you want it already is automatically is enabled. You want to, it's automatically here enabled as well but only when shift key is down, but I'm like, I want it all the time. So I'm gonna press that, press okay. So do you capture that? There's a general turn off your online DRC. Number two is go to board inside display and turn this off. So it always, it always highlights. Okay. Okay, you're gonna need to change this, but it's okay. So the rack nest is there, the layout, the layout, uh, the placement is done. So. The most important thing to just always keep in mind when it comes to PCB design is the flow. You're going from your PDR, which is your product design review, 
essentially your electrical engineer, your mechanical engineer, your designer should be there, your, uh, the, the end user, whoever is paying you, they're all going to come together and be like, well, okay, I want a, a, a phone. No, I want a satellite that has, has ABC. And it's like, okay, cool. I don't know how to create that. Let's all work together. Let's create that. That's what your PDR is. Sometimes it goes from two hours to four hours to, oh gosh, so long. Um, get your PDR. Then your electrical engineer creates the board. This is what, no, we didn't touch this in the presentation, but your electrical engineer will create the board. Your mechanical engineer knows that, like for example, your phone, right? Your electrical engineer is like, I know what, like I need an LED, like a, a, a display on the phone. I need it to do this, that. I need a camera on it. I need peripherals, you know, all that stuff. Um, then your mechanical engineer is like, I need it to exist in a this by this box, and I need to, I need space for this, this, that, a motor, whatever it needs, right? Then um, your manufacturing engineer is like, oh, I need to make sure that we can even create this. So like, let me make sure that whatever we want to do, come by me, make sure that like we have the material, we have like how much it costs. Like for example, your end user, the person who paid you to do the board, is like, I want to keep it under. 5 million and it's like okay well we're going to take up this percent and the other guy's like no we need this percent and it's like how do we balance that out right so it's like everyone's working together the situation now is that your designer is like um your designer now you coming in is like okay why don't you create the board so the fun thing about pc design is that you have to talk to everybody <laughs> which is fun, right? You know, we love talking. So like you have to always interface with a bunch of the engineers that are on the board because you need to know exactly what's going on. I know the electrical engineer is saying like, I, they need this board. They're telling me this is the amount of current, which is under one amp, so it's not a problem. Um, my hair engineer is like, I need to be this small. I'm like, okay, I'll make it this small for you. The, the electrical engineer is like, I need this component on the left side of the board. I'm like, okay, I can do that. Like. These are just requirements of the puzzle that I need to create. That's it. Otherwise, everything's up to me. And I get to play around. So, Wait, Vicky. Yes. The problem isn't solved yet. Like, can you look on Discord real quick? Like, I put the, the picture on the, your Discord. Yeah. I, this is a DRC, right? Uh, yeah. It, it didn't, save, it didn't uh, solve the issue, though. We unchecked the box and everything. You press OK. Yeah. You press Save. Yeah, I press apply and then okay. No, you have to press okay. Oh, you apply okay and then and then you press save. Oh, and it's still there. Okay, I know the problem. Um, you have to go to oh right here tools reset error markers. You reset error markers essentially. Your DRC is putting all these error markers on the board because it's like you're not complying to the rules that I set. And then you're like, okay, fine, I'll fix it. Let's reset it. So you press that. Let me know if it doesn't change. Alright. So, good. Okay. So then, um, let's start adding interconnect, right? So place track right here. It automatically um, snaps to the net, right? So we're gonna go five volt to here. Of 50 mils or enough. This is a 10 mil width, as you can see on the bottom left. If I press tab, it'll pause this area right here. You'll see 10 mils. This is good. This is sufficient. Um, we don't have time to get into this, but if you're an electronic engineer or if you're a PC designer, the one app I highly, highly, highly recommend you download and look into is called Saturn PCB Toolkit. Saturn, like the planet, PCB Toolkit. It'll basically help you understand, like, for this kind of amperage, how much conductor width do you need? How much copper do you need? For this fuse, like, what's going on with it? For this kind of layer stacked up, how many vias do you need in it? So that's, like, really important um, for your design and also for your electrical engineer to know because, for example, they might have sensitive signals and then you're like, okay, well, let's work together, figure out how much spacing we need. Like, for example, right now, Oh, wait, I shouldn't be able to talk about that. I'm not going to talk about it. <laughs> I'm going to press pause, um, unpause. So see, it's going the 40 fit, 45 degree angle, shift, space bar, different angles. So we're going to connect it over here. There's like a little small circle there. You're going to snap to it and then it'll let go, right? So let's just continue to do that. 
45 degree angle, snap to it, 45 degree angle, or a straight line, snap. Snap. We don't have time to talk about the other things, but let's do this really quick. Ground to ground. This is not a problem to do anyways, so we can do this. What I'm talking about is like, for example, you want your ground ground connection, right? What I was saying earlier is that sometimes layers will be used entirely as copper for a ground signal. That means there's return ground everywhere. That means anywhere on the board, any signal can have a return path. So that's really nice. Um, so that's something to talk about later in the next conversation. But now we have everything done. We can move this down, create a new board shape if we wanted to. This is your silk screen, so we can move that around. So essentially, if I press three, oh man, where's the board? Ah, you, ah, hit board. This is what our board looks like. I press zero to refine that out. And this is what the board looks like, right? You have your copper through holes. It's a little spacing there. Um, this is your silk screen. This is the copper. See, if you see right here, you have a little bit of copper, but then it enters into the solder mass because you don't want copper exposed into ambient, your ambient temperature outside, right? Because there's, this is going to exist and then move on, be manufactured to a real life board. However, like anything touching copper will, like, it, it's just very sensitive. So you want an insulator to make sure like, well, if this is touching cold air, it's touching hot air, it's gonna be, not be a problem. That's a whole conversation when you get into testing protocols, like high accelerated, um, high accelerated stress testing. So example, they'll put this board into a chamber and they're gonna shake it like crazy. Then it's like, well, there's problems with like solder joint issues. There's a problem with like maybe the component's too heavy and we need to stake it, which means staking is like adding a piece of glue under it so it doesn't wobble and go crazy. Um, sometimes it's a temperature test where it's like, we're gonna heat up the board to this amount of temperature because we know that in our environment, it's gonna go to this temperature. Then it's like, oh, maybe the solder might melt. And that's a really big problem for a manufacturing issue. So that's why we have solder mass to get back to the point. Now we have this board. We can just control save. We would just like make it a little nicer. Move it around. So screen is important, right? Because I can move it over here. I can move it over here, which saves us space up here. Let me think about, let me move that there. And move that down. And then we're going to, okay, I won't take up too much of your time. Shift S S, create new board shape, design board shape, define board shape. Oh, that's Shift S again. Now we have a little board. You can add more silk screen to it. So you can press place text. Oh, where is text? Oh, yeah. You can paste the line. You can paste like, for example, Chris has for his company, he has a little like ohm symbol and he'll just like add in the image and then place that into the board and that will become silk screen. You can actually create an exposed version of whatever you want to do that means exposed copper so it'll literally just come out as copper and it's really cool however you can't you know fly with that board but you can do it for like ground station stuff or ground earth stuff um so that's really cool and yeah that essentially is pc design unfortunately we didn't get to talk about fab drawings or assembly drawings this time around but next time around we'll definitely touch base on that Essentially, fab drawings, like I said, are this board, and I'll show like these are the holes that exist on the board. Fab house, can you make sure that you can drill through this board and that this is like the material for the board? And it's like, okay, got it. Let's do it. Face it. Assembly house will push it over to assembly once fab board is created. You'll give them your assembly drawing, right? And the assembly drawing will be like, this component needs to be staked, which means it needs glue under it, or this component or these components didn't exist in this way. And we'll give them like our digital artwork for it, right? So this is just like a digital format of this board. Like, can you put it on like this? Can you use this material? Can you, um, I don't know, what else is there? Uh, 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 yeah, so many different things um, that are not hitting my head right now, but yeah, so this is design. 
I just want to leave some space. I know I caught you guys four minutes past time. Hopefully you are a little bit more aware. Well, next time we'll touch base on like copper pores, which is a ground pore that I was talking about. Next time we'll hit on the semi drawings and then hopefully next time we'll have a more difficult challenge because now you guys have the basics. Uh, but I did want to leave a little more room for questions, if anyone has questions on anything. Otherwise, <laughs> thank you for coming out. Um, please let me know if you do ever have any questions. I am always a resource forever and always to Hyperloop. Um, so feel free to ping me anytime. Sorry, did you? Did you Everyone good? Okay. What? How do you make it in real life? Physically. How do you make it physically? Fabrication, I guess. How do you make this physically? Or how do you turn it into a physical format? Yeah. Okay. This is a whole question. This is really good. All right. I'm just making sure how do we <laughs> not go into geek mode? Maybe we should go into geek mode. All right. So, um, Essentially how this works, right? Uh, so we're talking specifically about fabrication. Fabrication means fabricating the actual board because right now we have nothing. Um, so it is a designer will essentially create a fab drawing and then they'll create a, uh, they'll have a bunch of different documents with it, right? So like uh, they'll have the CNC drill, for example. So if you put uh, export here. So this is like kind of all of the documents that exist in the fab drawing. Okay, not all of them. Uh, wait, is it here? It's not here. Oh, fabrication outputs, sorry. This is it. So you have your Gerber files, which are essentially your artwork for every layer. So every layer is like, I'm gonna give the fabrication a house, the top layer, the bottom layer, the mechanical one, the board shape, the top overlay. Like I'm gonna give them, top overlay on it? Yeah, we'll, we'll give them all the files, which is your Gerber files. We'll give them our, NC drill files. Your NC drill files are the files that showcase like this is exactly the location where this hole exists. This is how big it is. This is how big the exposed copper around it is. That's a whole another com the conversation. Um, so a bunch of different files will be sent to them. Then they're like, okay, well, right now we have nothing. We just have your data. Like, what are we gonna do? Let's create the board. All right, so what I was talking about earlier is foil construction. Um, essentially a core. So let's just show this on here. So it's a little more interactive. Eh, in the... Ooh. Uh -huh. Okay. So this is, uh, why is that not showing copper? That's no fun. Okay. Um, okay, so essentially they'll have a core. A core is made of resin reinforcement and something else. So the most, okay, so basically the way to explain it um, is your reinforcement is like uh, uh, a fiberglass or a, po uh, what's the most popular? I should know this. Oh no. Epoxy, not epoxy. I'm not sure. Essentially, it's like it's like a an insulator. It's a some type of some form of material that is an insulator, right? Um, and then they'll create that. They'll cure it with two copper clads on top. Copper clads are basically just copper material. So then they'll like squish it together. It's different if you create like a one-sided board, which means one copper layer, two-sided board, two copper layer, multi-layer is gonna be a bunch of copper layers um, in between, that's curing it. The thing about dielectrics, when you have multi-layer boards is that you'll have resin. So resin is also an insulator. It's basically like glue, like I said earlier. Um, and it's like, they eventually, they essentially like form all this material together that they'll like smush it to kind of like this is a terrible metaphor, like dough, like you'll smush it together, it'll create the, the compact form of it, and then they'll squish it with copper, heat it up, press it together. Then you actually, so you do have copper, core, copper. Falling? Get that? Okay, so now you have it. However, I don't want copper the entire layer, right? 
because I only want copper on my through holes right here that is exposed. That's one one situation. Two is like, um, uh, I want specific areas because I don't want this outside cup, copper, whatever over here is not the same net as this copper, right? So you see this line right here? This signal is not the same as all the signals right here, which is why it is upsetting because you can't see the rest of the copper. But um, essentially we go through this whole process. It's called etching. Um, etching essentially is the removal of unwanted copper. So how that works is that um, I will have my core, right? Is, is this too geeky? I don't know if it's too geeky, but we're gonna go into it. I'll try to keep this quick. So like, we're gonna have this, this copper core copper, put it into like a, I don't know, into like a, so you know the way like, um, Polaroid images are imaged, right? It's like, uh, or what's the word? You know what I'm talking about. It's like, it's like you need to like put it in a very like confined space that has like red light only and like only negative images will be formed, right? So it's, like, it's kind of the same thing that's going on here. So it's like, I had this, I have a picture of the, the format of what I want the top layer to look like. I'm gonna put it on there. However, it's a negative image of what I want, which means what will form is a positive image. I don't know if that makes sense. That's a whole conversation. All right, so like basically, the picture on is not what everything I don't want. The picture that I'm gonna put over the thing is everything I don't want. I'm gonna image like a light on top of it, which cures everything that I do want. If that makes sense. Then I'm gonna put it into a solution, which is a cupric chloride and something something but basically i'll put it in swish it a little bit add a little more tension to to like to start the removal process every all the unwanted copper that i don't want is going to be depleted away so everything that i do want exists on the board and i see it um inside the presentation of which i believe is sent to you there i inputted a fabrication process um, which you can definitely take a look at the hard thing about this piece of design, I think, has a lot of red tape, at least in the learning air sector, because not many fabrication processes that I found actually exist online, which really sucks, which really doesn't give you a good foundation about understanding how PCBs are fabricated, which really, really sucks. Um, but hopefully, I believe they're working on it. So. Um, so basically you have the thing, the copper, however, when you have the copper, there's no holes in it, right? Because we didn't like draw anything through it. Then we'll have the copper that we want, they'll move forward. Um, they'll drill the holes into it, all the drills will enter in, blah, blah, blah. And then there's a whole process there that we won't get into. Then we're like, well, now we need to add solder mask, which is, which is this green area. They'll flow all the solder mask over it, do a whole like, situation again to make sure there's no solder mask on the the copper as an imaging situation and then they'll add the cell screen which is like this p1s1 they'll add it on there and then they will go through another process which is um if they do go through like conformal coating which essentially is now like a full this is like the full insulation it's like a little like liquid it's just like spritzing kind of and then it'll just like encapsulate the entire thing, which is just like another insulator. It's a bunch of insulation that goes on here because you have so many different materials in the board. And you don't want to expose them to anything when it comes to moisture, temperature, shock, if it drops on the floor. Um, so all of that is like nature here. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sorry, it's <laughs> a whole five minute tangent. Any more questions? And also feel free to ask on Discord, no problem at all. My gut. Yes. Yes. Where can you learn more about through design and everything about? Mm -hmm. Um. Well, I'm biased because I'm an all team user. <laughs> but this is kind of a funny joke because um it's it's like a whole debate about what the software is better blah 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 i happen to believe that i think well to be fair so like the the software that i know is, is eda keycad 
Altium, and then PADS, um, PADS Mentor Graphics, and then PADS Expedition. Um, and that's why I'm saying there's a lot of red tape. However, to just generally understand more about PCB design, I learned a lot from Altium designers, uh, like information online. I think they're really good at constant learning and teaching. Like they'll have like little like seminars that are free that you can join in on and just understand things. To be honest, those are a little more advanced that I'm not, I'm confused about. So, <laughs> but like they'll go like, Never mind, that's a whole thing like HDMI, RF, and stuff like that, um, which I think is really interesting, but that's not a good place to start. So, like, um, let's see how we can. Uh, it's not. Um, okay, so let's look on Altium Designer. So, we can go to Altium Designer, PCB Design Software. Um, what is it? Resources and support. Can do that. I mean, there's a bunch of education programs that they do, which cost money, so that's no fun. Um, but for example, oh, I don't. Oh my gosh! Why does this always happen? Oh, I'm screen sharing the wrong thing. <laughs> Share. Okay, can you see my screen now? Yeah. Okay. So this is Altium Designer's uh, website. For example, though, if I look up Altium Designer uh, design rules, which is like one specific area, right? Like they have so many things that are available that you can learn more about. So they'll go here. There's a bunch of documentation, which it's not always fun, right? But the fun thing is that I think the way Altium like documents their things is actually very interactive and very like interesting because it kind of like they are constantly up to date always constantly trying to teach which is really nice so the funny thing is like pads mentor graphics sorry if anyone likes pads mentor graph i don't think anyone likes pads mentor graphics but when i was working on it and i had a question i'd look it up the most up-to-date thing they had was like back in 2002 and the only way, this isn't Thermo Fisher, right? The only way that I could go get my question like helped was going to another person at the company because they've been there for 30 years. And I was like, oh, how am I going to learn? You know, like, I, like, I mean, like besides like really doing it by myself and like having to have so much time to scrap and back, and, like I can't just Google something, which is really, really, really annoying. But Altium is really good because they're always constantly like trying to fix and trying to teach and trying to be up to shape. So if you go to like the documentation, that's a really good place to learn. I really think it's important to look at like fabrications you on YouTube. Um, but the best, best, best way to learn is by doing. So I would say like create this board um, or create like go online and look up uh, PCB design layout or PCB design circuit, and then grab that circuit, put it onto your software, design it, see how other people designed it. See like if, if, if that option is available, see how they designed it. Um, try a bunch of different methods. Like the point about PCB design is having experience, right? So if you have experience creating layout, if you can put that into your portfolio that you tried this and that you did this, showing that you even like today had a little bit of experience with Altium designer and say, you know, it is very beginner, but you know a little bit more now which is really important right um so i would really say like go check those out create your own things like chris said if you fabricate something it's very simple not too expensive less than two dollars really maybe but you can ask chris too right so <laughs> but, um yes i would i would recommend doing that and just starting getting your hands just deep in it Anyways, any questions? Any more questions? Yeah. Any more questions? I'm so sorry, it's like 18 past. You have one more question? Yeah. Yes. Can we simulate schematics on Altium or no? 
simulate schematics like LT Spice? Like, yes. yeah, yeah. I believe there is a function, yes, that you can do that. I don't know because I don't simulate. <laughs> this is, I, I, um, yes, I should like simulating, but I do not, and I'm okay with that. But uh, I do believe there is some, something. I know some electron. I believe I've heard of it. Mm, mm. Oh. Let me think, let me think, let me think. Hmm. I think generically, if we're talking about LT spice, no. We're just simulating. I would say that's a fuzzy gray area that I don't know specifically, so I would look that up. But in, in terms of like what LT spice does, no. I believe. I actually shouldn't say anything because I don't truly know, but <laughs> yeah, that it's unfortunate. Usually what I see is like like people will like simulate on LT Spice and like bring that like you can obviously put photos on schematic documents. So just like copy and paste like what they got from LT Spice onto here. That's not obviously simulating, but yeah, it's just like a it's LT Designer is mainly a PC design software. That's really good for integration of schematic documents, manufacturing capabilities when it comes to printing out fabrication outputs, slash assembly outputs, and then actual designing is like very advanced for it. So, yeah. Any more questions? No, we're good. We're good. All right. Okay. Well, thank you again, for everyone coming today. Um, like I said, like I said, please let me know if you have any questions, even if, you know, whenever, wherever you are, forever and always. Hi, Blue. Just kidding. We're not, we're not Greek. <laughs> but I think it's funny. Um, but honestly, like, I think it's very important in this world to just always maintain your network. So um, you never know. Aerospace is also a very small world. So if you ever enter into the aerospace industry, let me know, because eventually we might even be working together. So um it's very weird, but <laughs> um, any questions at all ever, PC design, schematic, document stuff, if it comes to industry stuff, professional questions whatsoever, if I can help in any way, please let me know. Um, but yeah, thank you again for coming and I'm excited. Hopefully we'll see you at the next one, whenever that is. All right, thanks guys. Thank you, I'm free to go, so sorry. Thank you for staying a little longer. Yeah. <laughs>